will be a focus. Some of you know I used to work in advertising, so you can trust every word you hear from me <laughs> and every picture you see. <laughs> I actually spent 10 years working in advertising in London and New York, and uh, I loved it. I don't know how you feel about whatever it is you do now, whether you're a student, whether you're in, in paid work or unpaid work, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're retired, whether your key zone is the golf club, wherever it might be, but I loved it. I loved the people, I loved the pace, I loved the creativity, and the lunches, <laughs> just fantastic. But uh, my testimony is just that I saw God do extraordinary things in that advertising agency, answer prayer on prayer, draw people to himself over time, heal someone on the 10th floor of a Madison Avenue advertising agency in the middle of the day, and more than once, impact the work itself, change the heart of probably or rather, probably, the most difficult client in the world. Uh, guide me through career disappointment that comes to most of us, character failures, and romantic catastrophes, with the emphasis on the plural. And so, what did I learn? And what I learned was that God can work through anyone, in any context, anywhere, and that we can trust him, whether our context is indeed a school gate or a toddler's group, or our grandkids, or a lecture room, or a workplace. So now I work for LICC, and when I'm asked to talk about LICC, I normally uh, illustrate what we do using the example of one of the greatest of all post-war British heroes, a man who is guaranteed to save the world once every three years. And of course, that is Bond, James Bond. <laughs> now, Bond, James Bond is not widely acclaimed in Christian circles. Uh, for reasons of which I hope you're aware of, and if you're not, change church instantly. Uh, though I suspect, honestly, that there's probably not a man in this room who's not at some point imagined himself to be Bond, James Bond. Uh, and actually, I do have some evidence of this. Um, yeah. And apparently the uh, role is up for grabs, and the last person was a Northern Irish, or at least an Irishman, so Jeremy is uh, going for that role. Most of us, of course, are not like but, uh, Sean Connery, you're more like sort of Johnny English, sort of <laughs> hopeless. But Bond does have some qualities worthy of praise. He is courageous, he is persevering, and he's resourceful. He is the master of technology and never its slave. He is decisive and he is patriotic. He may, like Samson, sleep with the enemy, but unlike Samson, he never gives away secrets critical to national security. He is strong, agile, multi-skilled, intelligent, witty, cultured, and honest. He's also a male chauvinist pig, an emotional desert, and a spiritual black hole. But apart from that, <laughs> when Bond, James Bond goes on his missions to save the world, five things are true. He is properly briefed, he is properly trained, he is properly resourced, he is commissioned, and he is properly supported. Now, when we ask adult Christians across, across the nation whether they feel properly briefed, trained, resourced, commissioned, and supported for their role in their daily life beyond the church, I don't project that on anybody here or any church here at all, but on the whole, most people say no. And if I were to ask you the question whether your church had prayed for you when you got a new job or prayed for you when you went into retirement into a new phase of life, how many would put up their hands and say, my church prayed for me in those contexts? Well, we've probably got 20 people in the room and that is a question that this topic addresses. Why is that? Because if we get our purpose right, next year, if somebody asks you that question, they won't invite me back. <laughs> Every hand should go up really, shouldn't it? So this is actually vital, in my view. If we get our purpose right, we will be praying for one another and our communities will be praying for one another 
for those contexts. So what on earth are humans here for? So what do we do? That's, uh, that's that. So I was founded by John Stott. He's the one on the right. Um, and uh, we empower Christians to make a difference with our own. We really love the church and love uh, working alongside church leaders who are doing such a fantastic job in so many places to help them do this. So what on earth are humans for? This morning we're going to look in some depth at this overall question of human purpose. And uh, James Robson, the CEO here, has focused this for us. And he's focused this this way. What are the implications of being created in the image of God and commanded to make disciples for our everyday Monday to Saturday lives? So today, a sort of chunky bit on purpose, a biblical trajectory, if you like. What's our purpose in God's big mission? And then tomorrow, if this is our purpose in God's mission, what does that do? What are the implications for that, for whatever it is we do during the day? For that. And then on uh, day three, we're looking at, if this is our big purpose, what does human fruitfulness in Christ look like day by day? And on the final day, we'll be looking at how we fuel ourselves with the Bible. So before we begin, so that we can indeed earth this, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to talk to someone very briefly. Not everybody likes doing this. If you don't want to talk to somebody, that's fine. This is only 60 seconds each. I want you to think of, whoops, a way of not throwing the technology around. Uh, I want you to think of a, a, a significant, a place where you spend a significant time during the week, and then two things you like about it, and one thing you dislike. You've only got 60 seconds. Ideally, you talk to someone you didn't walk in the room with. A person who is a stranger. So you may have to turn around. Only 60 seconds each, give that a go. If you haven't swapped, you need to swap. Let me stop you there if I can. Let me stop you there. Maybe you haven't got to the second person, but uh, maybe later. So Ed is 23 years old, and he uh, works in a factory. And uh, true story. And um, I wonder how you would respond to the question that he asked. Ed is 23, as I said, works in a factory. He's bored. He's overqualified. And... Um, he uh, prays to the Lord God, the King of the universe, Lord God, King of the universe, I'm bored and I'm overqualified, could you please get me a new job? And nothing happens. And then he asks his small group uh, to pray, and they pray to the Lord God, the King of the universe, uh, Ed is bored, he's overqualified, can you give him a new job? And nothing happens. And then he asks the whole church to pray, a church of about 80 people, and they all pray to the King of the universe, and nothing happens. Ed is getting a bit frustrated. He wonders whether he should be a worship leader or what his next step is. And then one day he meets somebody from one of my colleagues called Neil Hudson, and he asks him the same question. You know, what's going on? Would you pray for me that I get a new job? Now the question is, what would you say to Ed? What would you say to Ed? I'm not going to ask you now. 
just hold that thought. What on earth are we here for? Well, let's uh, begin at the beginning, which is, as they say, a very good place to begin. And I'm going to drill down and build on some of the things that uh, Jeremy so eloquently um, expounded the other night from Genesis 1. So in the beginning, um, God, before humanity, God, before light, God, before matter, God, before biological life, God. And this God who is presented to us in the beginning as someone who creates with a plan, with a purpose, and he creates in an order, as you know. So we have... Day one, light. Day two, water and sky, earth and vegetation. And then on day four, he builds, he fills, if you like. He builds on day one. So light in principle on day one. On day four, we get light of another kind, stars. On day two, water and sky. Then the fish and the birds. The fish, obviously, for the water, the birds for the sky, occasionally diving in to get the fish. And on day six, we have the earth, and then God fills that with animals and humans. It's a clear plan. It's, it's, it's steady. It's, you know, it's all done in time. This is a God who does things with purpose. And then, as we heard, he makes humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. And the text goes on to highlight one phrase, as we heard. In his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And I want to look at this um, phrase in our image a little bit in some detail. This has generated much scholarly research. And what is meant by that phrase in his image and in his likeness? The two words in Hebrew are selem, image, and demut. And the majority of occasions that this word selem occurs, it refers to something physical. Not something abstract, something physical. And demut essentially means likeness, resemblance. Now, as you know, for many centuries, uh, Aquinas is to blame, I think, the focus of thought on what image of God means has been on what you might call moral or spiritual qualities that humans might share with God. Though what those particular qualities are, no one could quite agree. Some focused on the qualities that God might confer on humans that he did not confer on other creatures. Because clearly in the text, there is something very different about humans, as Jeremy expounded. Perhaps the capacity to reason, the capacity for sophisticated language, the capacity to plan for the long term, to not respond instinctively, as animals do. Or more broadly, image is, is understood as conferring a whole range of attributes that God has given human beings to empower them to do the thing he's asking us to do. If I want to create a creature that can fly, I need to give it wings and make them as light as possible, except, of course, as you know, for bumblebees that ought not to be able to fly at all. <laughs> if I want a creature that can rule the earth and all the other creatures on it, what form and capacities do I need to give that creature in order to do the job? How does he resource us? Now, that's one, one view. In the last sort of 30 years or so, the focus of scholarship, though, and I suppose the growing consensus is this, that the word for image is not actually about the emotional, spiritual, or moral qualities that God has uniquely conferred on human beings. That's the view. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that is the view. It's not about our nature as human beings. It's about our role as human beings. Now, how do they get this? As you know, Genesis 1 is this great text, but it's written in a, the context of the ancient Near East. When you track through, you can see that the writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, are not only giving us eternal truth, they're saying, it's not like the Babylonians. It's not like the Babylonians. So why is it called the greater light, the sun? Why don't they call it the Hebrew word, Shemesh? Because the word for sun in Hebrew sounds like the name of a Babylonian god. So I'm not going to use that word. Why do they call it the light, the lesser light? Don't we have a word for that? It's called the moon. Because the word in Hebrew, Yareach, sounds like the name of a Babylonian god. No, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make sure that this is unique. This is, you know, why does God create light? Because they believed that light was a god. So the whole thing, at one level, is eternal, but it's focused to, to dispel, to make sure the people of the time realized we are nothing like them. 
Our God is nothing like them. His view of human purpose is nothing like theirs. So then, when you ask yourself, what is, what is the image of God, or what does the image mean in that culture? Then in that culture, the images of the kings were displayed round their empires, or round their territories. So they functioned, if you like, as symbols of, this is where I rule, this is my jurisdiction. They were there to remind people who was in charge. And of course, we see, we've seen this a lot. You know, there was a time when every square, or at least every town and city and village in Russia had a statue of Lenin. You probably can't tell that that is Lenin, that is Lenin. Uh, but take it down, and it's really significant. You're saying regime change, take that image down, take that representation of power down. And of course, we did that, didn't we? Or at least that happened in Iraq. Take that statue down, and it's symbolic. So that's what's going on with images. And it's the same with idols. Idols in that culture, you get an idol, and what that does is that represents that here, that idol has jurisdiction, that idol has power, that idol has authority. It's to that that I look. So what does God's image mean within the context of that culture? What it means is this, that we are God's representative, his vice regent. That's what it means. We are like a king. We have been assigned to rule. That is the core meaning here. So the image of God as a phrase is primarily about the purpose for which God has created human beings. Now this actually is revolutionary and would have been revolutionary at the time. First of all, you have been created to be a vice regent of the king of kings with a specific job description which we will come to. I don't know how you feel about yourself right now, but I feel like, what? Hallelujah, thank you. Now for Israel's ancient Near Eastern neighbors, the role of being a vice regent of a god was the exclusive preserve of the king or the emperor. But that's not what our God is saying. Our God is saying it's not the exclusive preserve of one human being. The call to rule, the role to rule, is for every human being. We're all given authority and we're all given responsibility to rule in the places that God has put us. This is a radically countercultural document. And it is today when you think about how our cultures globally have become more and more focused on big leaders, whether they be in business or political, elites. And it's even more extraordinary because in the ancient Near East, the gods created human beings to be slaves, to be drones. I hope you're seeing that this is also countercultural in our culture. Our God doesn't need food or labor or anything like that. He calls us to rule, to represent him. And this is royal language. And this royal language that we are, in a sense, princes and princesses, if you like, sons and daughters of the king, goes right through the Bible. So you see it that we are a little lower than angels, and God made us rulers in, in uh, Psalm 8, I don't have time to take you through the whole Bible right now, but then he goes on, you know, what does Peter say? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. It's very, again, very high language. Paul uses extraordinary high language for the people of God. We've got used to be calling each other, maybe, maybe you don't call each other saints, good morning saints, maybe you don't do that. It's a very big word to call people holy ones, to call people ambassadors. The language that Paul uses to slaves and everybody else is, is elevated language. We are not clusters of amino acids. Seven billion of them on this ping pong ball of a planet floating in space. We are vice regents of the king of glory. Ancient Near Eastern culture is totally, totally radical and revolutionary. And of course it's affirmed in Genesis 2 where Eve is created to be a helper to Adam where helper, Aza, Aza is the Hebrew word, is a word that 
that is applied to God in relation to human beings. God is a helper. So helper, unlike in English, does not imply a subordinate, but if anything, someone you actually, who has something you need that you don't have, someone without whom you cannot complete uh, what you've been given to do. And of course, that applies to the church, doesn't it? We can't, we can't do this without one another. So our starting point here is that to be human is to be created as a royal vice regent of the king of the universe to rule over all his creation. Now, I am not saying, by the way, that anything, any of the other things that have been said about the image of God might not be true, but I, am, but I, but I actually am convinced by what I've just said, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be bringing it to you. Nor am I saying that uh, we are not infinite valuable and that every human is infinitely and equally valuable, whatever their race or gender or status. You see, we can get there in all kinds of ways. You can simba ponder the reality that God created each one of us personally, that he created humankind personally, that he formed each one of us in our mother's wombs, as David tells us, that he thought of us before the foundation of the earth. How can we possibly think that we are insignificant if God has thought of us before the foundation of the earth, that he's not willing that any of us should perish, that he sent his son to die for us because he so loved us and so on. But what this does within this text, it puts a radical focus on human responsibility. God has given us something to do. It doesn't come with domination as we heard the other night. And whatever we, um, we understand, if you like, by ruling, the Hebrew understanding of kingship is always connected to service. The king is there to serve the people, just as the supreme king did not come to, to be served, but to serve. So be fruitful and fill the earth with God worshippers. Brilliant, brilliant insight from Jeremy. After all, it's quite big, this earth. <laughs> And if you're going to rule over it, you're going to need more than two humans to do it. You're slightly limited with two. So what is the goal of this uh, rulership? What are we here for, if you like, having been given this huge assignment? So we have some clues. Genesis 2, the Lord God took the man. At that point, it was the man in this account. And put him in the Garden of Eden, Garden of Delight, uh, to work it and take care of it. Now, again, there are a number of words for work in Old Testament Hebrew. The word... Here is avad, which also is the word for service. The kind of work required is service. That is, human rule is in the service of God's creation, not its disservice or exploitation. And that's reinforced by the second word that is translated, take care of it. Now, take care of it does not mean that one leaves it just as it is as if it were some national trust property that one is trying to preserve in perpetuity just as it was back in the 18th century. And there's some splendid national properties around here. Anybody know where that is? Size of 10 points, 18 free coffees. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get there? How do we get to purpose here? So why, let's look at what God does and then see whether that gives us some clues. So why does God create Adam on day six. Why doesn't he just get on with it? Day one, let's get with a program, yay, yay, yay. Well, because if God had created Adam on day one, it would have been dark and there would have been nowhere to stand. So what's God done? God has made a place ready for human beings. Like, if you like, an ex expectant parent, you know, they decorate a room for a new baby. Or, you know, a single person, you make a home, you create, create a context in which you can flourish, and so on. By the time God brings humans into the picture, there is air to breathe, ground to stand on, water to drink, food to eat, animals to look after, purposeful work to done. What has he done? He has created a context for human flourishing. And that is what he, we see throughout Scripture. The Lord's desire out of love to create context for human flourishing. That's what his work does. And tomorrow we'll look a little bit at how our work conforms to that. The fall comes, but the mandate to rule 
remains. God's wrath at human depravity and rebellion leads to the flood, but he spares Noah and his family and the animals. And what does he get him to do? Look after the animals and the birds. The fish will be okay. (laughs) And to take with him enough humans to begin the project of filling and serving and working the earth again. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And again, God makes human beings the rulers over the creatures. All the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Every creature that moves along the ground. They are given into your hands. And it remains so God's vision for Abraham is that through him, another vice regent, another representative of the king of kings, all peoples would be blessed. And as we move forward from Egypt to the promised land, what do we see? God is seeking to try to create a context for people's flourishing. The commandments and the range of individual laws cover almost every sphere of life and are designed to enable a community to flourish under God. If you steal from one another, that's not really great for relationships. Murdering people isn't good for relationships either. They're no longer around. (laughs) Lying to people, it's not good. It creates, that's not a flourishing context. So the commands are to be applied personally, but they are communal to create a context, a community, a nation of flourishing people. And you see the same in the notion of holiness. Be holy because I, the Lord, your God am holy. And in Leviticus 19.1, I'm not going to take you all through this, but when you look at how to be holy, in Leviticus 19.1, it has to do with, you know, it has to do with parents, Sabbath, idols, offerings, harvest, fields, vineyards, the poor, foreigners, theft, lying, deception, oaths, fraud, prompt payment, treatment of the deaf, blind, impartial justice, slander, endangerment, hatred of fellow Israelites, rebuke, revenge, grudge, loving our neighbor, obedience to God's decrees, interspecies breeding, mixing crops, mixing textiles, sex with slaves, consumption of meat, divination, hairstyles, tattoos, prostituting daughters, mediums, respect for the aged, (laughs) treatment of foreigners, honest trading. Apart from that, that's just one chapter. And actually, the chapter is emblematic. It's not saying this is everything. It's giving us an imagination for how we create together communities that flourish. And the promised land is a land of rest, menucha. In Hebrew, the word for rest is not the absence of work. That's something different. That's stopping. That's Sabbath. Rest, for example, Naomi prays that her daughters-in-law would find rest in the homes of their of their husbands. Well, they've still, got, they've still got to make some food. They've still got to look after some kids. They've still got to do whatever you do. A lot of work to be done. It's not a prayer that they'd have nothing to do, but rather they would, if you like, that they would work, live, play, sleep in full-orbed shalom. That's the goal, shalom, peace. That's what, if you like, another word for what's understood by rest. And shalom is the key word, and we'll come to it. This seems to me to sum up God's aims for humankind, and we'll see this when we come to Jesus. Not long before we come to Jesus, just telling you. So what happens when they go to Babylon and they're exiled? They're told to pray for the shalom of the city, not only to pray for it, but to seek the shalom the peace and the prosperity. It's one word in Hebrew, and it's shalom. And shalom, as you probably know, means wholeness. It means completeness. It means everything is as it really, really should be under God. It's emotional, it's physical, it's spiritual, it's mental, it's ecological, it's environmental, it's political, it's societal, it's social. The whole gamut, that's shalom. That's what God wants. And then we see this same commitment to cosmic, to universal shalom at the cross. He is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn over all creation, praise be to his name. For, by, for in him, in him, all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and, well, here's, um, let me give you something. There's something visible. That's a toucan. You can see, I don't know if you can see how beautifully he's dressed. You can see those blue suede feet? Lovely color rhyme with the underneath of the bill. It's rather beautiful, isn't it? God did that. All things, visible things and invisible things, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Electromagnetism, quarks, Higgs bosons. Here's a picture of something invisible. <laughs> uh, that is a particle colliding in the Hadron Collider. How do they get these pictures? I don't know. So this is all things. This word all is quite important. There are seven alls and one everything in, those, in, in Colossians 1, 15 to 20. All things, all powers, all systems, all systems of organizational authority, everything was created by Jesus. Well, if everything is created by Jesus, wouldn't he continue to be interested in everything? Why wouldn't he be interested in every subatomic particle? Why wouldn't he be interested in every aspect of our lives? If I can be sharp, why wouldn't he want us to pray for one another before we go and do our shift emptying the bins in Hillingdon or anywhere else? These things don't just include the material world, do they? The thrones, the powers, the rulers, the authority, everything is submitted to Christ. And he's entrusted it to us. They're not only created by him, but for him. We are stewards, we are guardians. We are meant to be the cultivators of the forests we are hacking down, the guardians of the species that we are annihilating, the stewards of the pigs and the cows and perhaps the chickens too we're mistreating, the oceans we are filling with plastic, the rivers we are polluting with poison. They are his. And the master will return and asked us, what have we done with his possessions? And of course, this God, this Lord is interested in whatever we do because everything we do has an impact on his world and on the people created by him, thought of by him before the foundation of the world. But we know more that Jesus didn't, is not just the creator God, he is the redeemer by whom all things are redeemed, through whom all things are reconciled and so we read in Colossians 1.20, and through him, that is Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the Lord God, the Father, seeks to reconcile all things to himself, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making shalom, peace, a reigning in the Greek, Hebrew equivalent shalom, through his blood shed on the cross. So what is Jesus' blood shed for? The shalom of all things. God the Father seeks to reconcile all things, to restore all things to their right relationship with him, renovate all things. So this God invites us to participate with him in this great regeneration project, to make the world as much like he would like it to be before by his grace and love, his son returns to complete the work. So one way of looking at purpose is to say, our purpose is to seek the kingdom shalom of all the earth and all that is in it to the glory of God. And so a disciple of Jesus is someone called to make disciples who will be agents of this shalom, not only though gloriously messengers of the peace to be found in and through Christ, but co-laborers with Christ in the guarding and renewal of all things. So now we begin to ask ourselves, how might that purpose shape what we do at work and in the places we find ourselves during the week, what we might do in our church communities, what we might do in our neighborhoods, what we might do in our families. The 
the social activist, uh, an American social activist called Tony Campolo. Anybody familiar with Tony Campolo? A few hands, and not quite a number of you. If you're familiar with him, you'll know that he's a very quiet, understated guy, uh, very low energy, you have to listen very carefully. And one of the things that he said was this, Evangelism, he said, evangelism is an invitation to join a movement to change the world. And uh, if you know Tony Campolo, he always speaks with his eyes closed. I don't quite think he has the script written on his eyelids. So. Now, you know, and he knows, and I know that evangelism is more than that, but it is nevertheless, because we are creating the image of God to be his vice regents, to represent his rule on earth whether that is in the way that we look after our God, sorry, our dog, which I found quite convicting, when I suddenly realized, Finley, you're a Sheltie, and I'm meant to be God's representative to you. I need to repent. <laughs> we are freed from the power of sin, death, and Satan, and empowered to become new creatures in Christ to live in his ways. So every disciple can be part of God's plan and God's purposes in time and eternity. The whatever of Colossians 3.17 and 3.23, the whatever you do, which we'll come to tomorrow, connect to the alls of Colossians 1. And that's what we'll see. Because everything matters to God, whatever we do matters to God. Because it's all His, whatever we do matters. Because everything is His because he wants to restore, renew, it, and will come back and complete his work. It all matters. The mission of God, the Missio Dei, as Christopher Wright puts it, is bigger, is bigger than helping people to get to know Jesus. God's plan is for the renewal of all things. We may define mission, and often in the past we have, as cooperating with God to seek and save the lost. And that is clearly a priority. But that is only part of the bigger mission that God invites us to join. So this abundant life is not an ethereal, disembodied life in the spirit without reference to the everyday realities of life in Wigan or Wrexham, Watford or Warrington. God is interested in all the places that we spend our time, wherever that might be. In other words, the cross changes everything. The cross changes everything. The good news embraces everything. All our whatevers are woven into his all. What does this mean, practically? What does doing everything unto the Lord look like when you understand that all your whatevers are intended to be part of this bigger whole? Just as every gift and every person in the body of Christ has a role to play in his glorious church, it's intended to be part of that whole. It means that anything we do can be done differently. And any place becomes a place of potential mission. Thelma is uh, 93 years old, which may be older than anybody in the room. <laughs> and uh, she's part of a small church, and I mean small, under 20, called uh, Rainbow Community Church in West Bromwich in, uh, in the Midlands. And uh, she's had a few sermons in her life. It's a Baptist-oriented church. She loves the Lord, and she loves the church. And she does a few things there, but um, she didn't really feel that she had a mission any longer, you know, a thing that God was really getting her to do. And then one day she was taken through some material that happened to be um, developed by one of my colleagues called Life on the Front Line. And suddenly, suddenly for Thelma, she realized something. She had a mission field. She, at 93, had a mission field. And it was the Asian convenience store at the bottom of her road where she bought her shopping. So her friends, of course, she's 93, and she's not as swift on her pins as she was when she was 89. <laughs> and her friends are very worried that she's going to fall over and break her hip or something. You know, please, please let us do your shopping, particularly in the winter. But no, Thelma's off the, 
she's off, sleet, snow, rain, shine, I'm going there, this is my place. And she goes, she goes in there, she prays for that Asian family, she gets to know people. Pretty soon everybody's hugging everybody. And uh, pretty soon, actually, members of the family are carrying her shopping home for her. So she gets the little five, ten minute walk, probably walks even slower just to keep them going. <laughs> and uh, then pops them in her kitchen and so on. And apart from the blessing, apart from the prayers that she's praying for each one of those, because she realizes that she can serve God anywhere and in her shopping too, she's exhilarated because she's walking with Jesus into her day. That's what it does. When you realize that you can work with God in anything, when you realize that she could bring shalom, wholeness, joy, and the message of Christ into that group, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When you see that places that we thought were irrelevant don't become irrelevant anymore. Now, of course, this can be incredibly uh, guilt-inducing, can't it? Never get out of the supermarket. <laughs> That's not the point. The Lord, the Lord discerns, helps us discern where he wants us to spend our time. But the key point is there. There is now no place on his planet which not only does Jesus say, this is mine, but where he might want to work through us. Now this expression of our mandate doesn't just find expression in Genesis, it finds expression in the great commandment. Let's go to that, shall we? Whoops. All authority, again, notice that word authority. We've been in authority in the beginning and Jesus gave us that authority. The triune God gave us that authority and now, once again, he is reiterating that as Jeremy made the point uh, on Saturday, if you were here. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciple of what? Not of all people, of all nations. This is still a global project, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey, here's a word, everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. In, in the Greek, it's all the days. All authority, all nations, all the days, to the very end of the age. So in terms of the calling of God's people, those in Christ, the calling is not primarily to make converts. It is not to make church members. It is not to make ordained clergy, though we definitely need some, <laughs> but to make disciples. This is the primary instruction. Now, disciple, many definitions, but it's someone learning to follow Jesus in their context at this time. It's not disembodied from life. It's not just some sort of generic thing. You are all in different contexts, all with different relationships, all with different limitations. Now, they're to teach everything that Jesus has commanded. I think if you are a writer or an author, this is quite a clever ruse, isn't it? So I'm a writer, I get to the end of the book and I say, in order to understand this book, you've got to go back to the beginning and read it again. Essentially, that's what Matthew is saying. Everything I've taught, oh right, I've got to teach them everything Jesus taught. Right, better start at the beginning. <laughs> and I've got to read Matthew all over again. What does he teach in Matthew? All of that. Oh, by the way, he's the word of God. Oh right, okay, so I've got to teach the whole Bible. Yes. The Great Commission is not a call to evangelism, it's a call to make disciples. Interestingly, this is not the vision of discipleship that we've had in evangelicalism for the last 200 years. The church in the West, mainly, has been beset by what you might call the sacred-secular divide. That's the belief that some things are really important to God not all things, and some things are definitely not important to God. So church, prayer, social action, really important to God, and they are. Work, sleep, rest, sport, the arts, not important to God. Well, the arts, if it's got Christian words, yes, that's okay. Um, and because of that, very few of you have been commissioned into your jobs when you've had them or into your retirement, because actually somehow inadvertently, by the way, no one is saying to anybody, huh, all of life is not significant to God. No one is saying that, because we know it is. But operationally, the culture doesn't do certain things. 
because they've lost sight of our purpose. So a teacher once said to me, I teach Sunday school 45 minutes a week and they haul me up to the front of the church to pray for me. I teach in a school 45 hours a week and no one has ever prayed for me. Now that's a teacher, that may not apply in your church, we tend to pray for teachers and medics, but you see the point. The point she's making is, is this 45 minutes a week and I'm with kids that the parents at least want to send to Sunday school and I'm probably supported by people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm doing this for 45 week, minutes a week. That is significant, praise the Lord for it. And here's 45 hours a week where the children may have no Christian influence at all, where I may not be supported by anyone on, in the teaching staff or in the staff more generally who is a believer in Jesus, and we're not praying for that. Now, which is more important? And the answer is neither, both are important. But one gets the prayer and the other doesn't. And that is the result of not understanding our purpose. You see, you can tell a church by its prayer diary. Where your heart is, there. Where your prayer is, there your heart is. In some ways, this is sobering, sobering material, isn't it? I mean, it, it's sobering. This, um, that's uh, some mathematics in case you're wondering. Now, the Great Divide, uh, I'm going to ask you a very smart Alec question in the moment. This, this belief that some things are really important to God and some things aren't. As I say, no one, no, one, no one is going to say that, but it's operational. So if I ask this question, how many people here could give me a biblical view of mathematics? You say, well, that's a very smart Alec question. That's a little bit over the top. Come on, be real. Probably a few people could. Um, but how many of us might have interested maths at school? And would you put your hands up? You know, a bit of interaction. There's a number of you who apparently didn't do maths at school. I was very worried. <laughs> um, uh, and if you did do maths at school, I'm sad that many of you didn't, um, you probably did it for 11 years, one hour a day, five days a week, for eight months of the year. Maybe a, a year or two longer if you were very bad at it, because you've got to get GCSE maths, <laughs> or a year or two longer if you're very good at it. And probably at least half of you grew up in Christian homes. So here's something you've done every day for eight months of the year for 11 years. So asking a question, could you think biblically about that, is not, is not actually such a smart aleck question, is it? Now, of course, maths um, is a language that helps us dimensionalize size and speed and force and so on. It gives us insights into difficult concepts like eternity and the Trinity. And I do remember my eight-year-old son, Tommy, coming to me one day and saying, Dad, Trinity, but, you know, what about one plus one? plus one equals three. Gotcha, Dad. So I said, what is one times one times one? One. Gotcha, Tommy. <laughs> Fantastic to defeat one's eight-year-old son, isn't it? <laughs> By the time he was nine, it was the other way around. Now, but here is the issue, and this is the sobering issue. The reality is, that almost all our children and grandchildren are going to school and studying subjects without any sense of why they might be important to God. Why is learning French or Welsh or Gaelic important to God? Why is history important to God? I mean, these don't have to be incredibly difficult answers, but, but actually they don't know. So if you don't know why maths or anything is significant to God and how it might fit in with his purposes, you think, oh, I'll think, oh, well, what am I going to do with maths? I'm quite good at it. Well, I'll go do engineering. And you don't know why engineering is significant to God when you're studying at university. One man said to me, I practically guarantee you that there's hardly a student, this is somebody who worked for UCCF, hardly a student in the UK who could give you a th biblical view of the subject they're studying for three years. Well, if you don't know why engineering is significant to God, then why would you think that doing engineering is significant to God? So this is actually really significant, isn't it? If our purpose is to do something in the world and, and all our children and our grandchildren are making choices about their work, making choices about their careers, making choices about whether to work or not work, whether, whether you know, to say, I'm going to stay home, 
I'm going to be a house husband. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a, a house mother. Whatever the, the right language these days is. Whatever that is, it's got to be connected to the overarching purpose. Now, this has uh, very big implications for us because uh, for not only for our children, but for, for the, the, the gospel itself. See, what we have is what you might call um, a leisure time uh, Christianity. Now, that's just a resource if you want to look at it. Um, you can see it on our website, The Great Divide, which looks at this in more detail if you'd like it. Uh, let me tell you what I mean by why it has an implication for the gospel. Dorothy Sayers, with some, some of you familiar with her books and her novels, uh, she wrote a, an essay 80 years ago, a, a contemporary of uh, C.S. Lewis, a great apologist, um, and she, she wrote this. It, it starts off about work, but it's actually about the gospel. And she says this, in nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She's allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? So her point is not about work. Her point is about the gospel. How could anybody be interested, really interested? And young people today want a, a gospel that is for everything. They want everything to count. They want an adventure in life. They do not want to be one person Monday to Friday, a different person on Saturday, and a different person on Sunday. And we have something that does it. In Christ it all matters, but that is not what they're told. In Christ it does. So what are we here for? To seek the kingdom shalom of all the earth and all that is in it to the glory of God. If you like, to bring it to the personal, to seek to bring, to seek and pray, to bring kingdom shalom to the places you find yourself, the people you meet, and the tasks you do to the glory of God. So what would we say to Ed? Poor, bored, overqualified Ed, and I empathize, many people are in boring jobs. So my, my colleague, Neil Hudson, who's written brilliantly on this material for church leaders, Neil Hudson, said to Ed, so Ed, if you've prayed to the Lord God, King of the universe, and nothing's happened, if your small group has prayed to the Lord God, King of the universe, and nothing's happened, if the whole church has prayed to the Lord God, King of the universe, and nothing has happened, and you don't have a new job, what does God want you to do there? Now, there's lots of answers he could have answered, you know, given. Could have been a pastoral thing, well, you know, could have been about patience and Lord teaching you things and suffering is good and so on and so forth or it could be a practical thing you know if you didn't have a red Mohican and nine earrings it might be easier to get a job in a bank <laughs> you know it could be practical stuff all kinds of things you might say and they'd be helpful but what he said was was that what do you think God wants you to do that and then he quoted Jeremiah 29 7 pray for the peace and prosperity of the place that God has called you and seek it, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. A few years later, uh, uh, Neil uh, met this guy again, I think at a rival conference whose name we will not mention, Spring Harvest. Other conferences are available, aren't they? Um, and um, this guy, Ed, said to Neil, you know, I did get a job in the end, another job about 18 months later, but I'm so grateful for that time, God, really taught me stuff, you know, what, what he did is he, he went in early, he blessed the people, uh, started praying for them for quietly on his own to begin with and then out loud, suddenly he had a ministry. Was his job boring? Actually, yes. Was his day boring? No. When we know our purpose, then we're always walking with the Lord. We're not thinking about necessarily the next thing or the last thing. We're thinking right now, Lord. How can I be a bringer of your shalom? Well, tomorrow, this has been, if you like, Romans 1 to 11. <laughs> uh, thank you for bearing with me. And tomorrow, we're going to look at this very practically in terms of the things we do day by day. Jeremy, Mr. Bond, would you like to come and pray for us? <laughs> hmm.
What a fantastic start. Thank you so much, Mark. That was so rich. Um, round of applause. Isn't it lovely to go into today, all the practical things of today, saying it is our job to spread God's shalom. I've got to go and spread God's shalom to my family in the next few minutes. Um, we have 45 minutes now, so use your mathematics. We have 45 minutes to go and grab a cup of coffee and then come back for our morning Bible reading. So let's just commit us to the Lord now, and uh, may we retain in our brains and in our souls what we've been listening to today. Father, thank you for Mark. Thank you for all that he has shared with us. Thank you that there's not a wasted minute in the life that you've given us. Help us to spread your shalom uh, to our families, to others at this convention, to this town today, and then when we go back home and our workplaces and wherever you take us. Thank you, Father, that we can be your image bearers. What a glorious role. Help us to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. See you soon. Have a great day. Shadows deep, where doubts trace every step.